This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 29 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Exclusive coverage of the world of dressage. We would like to thank our sponsors, Kentucky Performance Products. They can be found at kppusa.com. This is Chris Stafford in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm Heather Blitz in Wellington, Florida, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. Well, hi, Heather. Uh, Welcome back. Welcome back to the show. Welcome back to the country. Great to have you back, and thank you so much for spending time to come on the show, uh, taking the time, because I know it's pretty busy for you down there as you get settled into your new home and training establishment. Yeah, it, busy is a is a mild word for it. It's it's really quite chaotic. But um, every day I check more things off my list, and that's a great feeling. So it's been a um, a lot, a, a big deal to make the move. But um, really happy that that part's over and moving forward into getting all set up here in sunny, warm Wellington, Florida. I haven't sweat this much in the past three years of my life, and I've only been here about four days now so <laughs> I hope it cools down a little bit coming up in uh, in December and January well I am for you uh, but I know it's been a bit you know you've been what three years did you say in in Denmark three years and a little more yeah so yeah. Um, beautiful summers but definitely freezing in the winter and um, came straight from that to this it's a it's a, it's a nice change I have to admit I can imagine it would be. You know, it's pretty cold and miserable up here in Kentucky right now. And but you know, we are heading into winter, and well, I think winter's really, you know, head, heading heading our way right this week. So uh, we'll, we'll just have to get used to it. But you know, I do envy you down there because it it really is a great place to be a based and training for the winter, isn't it? It's uh, it's very special, very nice. Yes, fortunate to be here. Well, great for you, great to you to be back in the country too. I mean, I know you've you've had a, a lot of uh, you know really interesting experiences while you've been based in in Denmark. We have seen you over here for the occasional clinics too. So uh, you uh, you've still maintained your following, Heather, which uh, which is important, obviously, if you're setting up in business. I'm sure. Well, absolutely, and I don't like to leave any of my clients hanging too long. So it's been nice to come back and visit. Um, visit everybody and, and keep some, you know, help coming their way. So, and those clinics will continue as I'm back here. It's just a little easier to get to them now. Well, we're, we're looking forward to, you know, having you join us on the, sh- on the show whenever you can, Heather. And uh, um, we're delighted you're going to spend some time with us this week. And we've got lots in store. Um, you're actually going to be my co-host, but you're also going to be our guest this week. So we're going to combine all those things. We're going to talk about some really interesting uh, information that you have about shipping horses internationally because uh, you're, you're quite experienced at it now, having what, brought just five horses over just now. Yep, there were that many with us this time and a um, number of trips in the past also. So a lot of people have a lot of questions and, and don't know very much about it. So I thought it'd be fun to um, kind of, you know, tell, talk about some of the experiences and how it goes. And, um, and um, yeah, it's an interesting process. So be fun to talk about. Wonderful. Well, we'll look forward to to uh, hearing your experiences. But before we get into that, Heather, we've got a few items of news this week. There's an awful lot happening on the international scene and and over here too. And the first item of news that that we want to convey is from the FEI. You remember that the the FEI introduced um, a progressive list um, that was. Uh, presented to the General Assembly in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, just a few weeks ago. And that was something of a surprise to the national federations. And there's been quite a bit of kickback. Um, so in the end, the General Ass- the um, FEI have decided that they will call for a kind of ostensibly a time time out, if you will. And while they're going to use implement the – or they're asking the national federations to implement the – 20th of October list um, in uh, and that and put that into effect in April 2010 
They're going to place the issue of the NSAID policy on the agenda. That's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They're going to put that, they're asking for that to be put on the agenda for the 2010 General Assembly, which will take place in Taiwan next November, which in effect, of course, means that that will be off the table um, until after the World Equestrian Games. So that letter uh, was, was issued just today to or the member national federations um, in the FEI family uh, from Princess Hire. So she will be uh, looking for a response from the national federations to that uh, proposal. And uh, I think that will certainly uh, appease a lot of the national federations in Europe particularly because there's a very different policy in Europe to what there is um, in um, uh, in, in the States. And, and, and Heather, you'll be familiar with, with both of those, of course, having lived in Europe and and uh, competed here. Right. Well, I think, um, you know, the important thing for, for people to to remember or think about when, you know, this on this subject is, um, you know, the, the hype, a lot of hype on doping, whether it's equestrian or human, um, I think more questions are raised if it becomes a matter of performance enhancing drugs. And um, of course, those aren't being added to the progressive list whatsoever. It's only the, the um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, and, you know, it's been a it's been a long uh, time in history that there have always that there have been very adamant two sides to this. And um, if it ever gets to be where we can all agree on, you know, one one way or the other. I don't know, but um, you know, there's got to be a line between where you are allowed to, you know, help horses out in their benefit, or where, um, you know, others will take advantage as much as they can to mask things that they shouldn't be masking. And um, you know, it's a it's a subject that is important. I think it, is, it has been a, a, a big surprise to you know, the world that it's um, come out and that it's, a uh, you know, the progressive list is even um, considered at all. But uh, I think it's pretty interesting to see where this goes. Um, I don't need to say where I stand on, on what side I stand on, but um, I think it, it is important to discuss it and bring it back up. And um, just as long as we all have the horse's best interest, of course, um, but it'll be interesting. I think it will. I mean, while they're buying time, of course, um, we still have to get everybody on the same page at the end of the day. So it, it will certainly be an ongoing debate that we will follow here on the Dressage Radio Show. Um, and another big item of news, too, this week, Heather, is that Anne Gribbons has been um, named by the U.S. Equestrian Federation as the Dressage Technical Advisor through 2012. That role will include the coordination of all aspects of the USEF Dressage High Performance Coaching Program, which uh, Anne will oversee, including the training and preparation for World Equestrian Games, Pan American Games, and Olympic competitions. And she'll also advise the USEF High Performance Committee regarding the allocation of training grants and the selection of athletes for teams. Anne will also monitor the form and soundness of prospective horses and the form and riding skills of candidate riders in order to identify areas for improvement. And <clears throat> earlier this year, you remember that um, Klaus Balkenhol, who was the former USEF dress, dressage coach, uh, who, after he resigned, that, that there was a um, an offer on the table for Anne Gribbons to take the dual role of chef to keep and technical advisor. But uh, after Anne was named at the uh, US at the FEI General Assembly to be uh, on the FEI Dressage Committee for a term through 2012, um, it was decided that to avoid potential conflicts of interest uh, with those roles that uh, she would step down as potentially a chef to keep and just fulfil the role as technical Advisor, and of course, she's also been named to the World Equestrian Games judging panel. Um, Heather, I'm sure you've been following this story because you're on the high performance committee yourself, aren't you? Aren't you the active athlete, isn't it? That uh, you're on? Yeah, eligible athlete committee, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, so it's official now, and I guess that um, uh, it was announced earlier that she was um, up for that, and now it's official. So, congratulations to Anne, and good luck to her with that. 
heavy list of jobs to, uh, <laughs> to look after. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is a huge responsibility. And uh, we should point out, too, that the USEF will fill the role of the chef to keep or managing director um, in the near future. So we'll bring you news when that is announced. Um, and on uh, on the horse front and competitor front, um, Stefan Peters and, uh, has announced that he's not going to be defending the World Cup title that he won earlier this year in Vegas with Ravel. And he's been in discussions with the owners Aikiko Yamazaki and uh, Jerry Yang, who own um, the 11-year-old Dutch warm-blood gelding Ravel. <clears throat> and they decided to save the horse and, and focus on the Equis World Dressage Masters in Palm Beach in February and the selection trials for the World Equestrian Games uh, that will take place at Gladstone, New Jersey in July. And, of course, the main focus of their program will be the World Equestrian Games. And I have to say, taking on the likes of Ed Garl and Totias and uh, Adeline Cornelison with Parsifal, it's it's going to be a real ding-dong uh, contest, isn't it, at World Games? I'm looking forward to that, aren't you, Heather? I mean, that's going to be as good as it gets, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be pretty exciting, and I don't blame him for um, wanting to save Ravel a bit. That's the, that would be quite a bit to do the three. Um, so much pressure, you know, when you're at the top and you and you really are in the running for one, two, or three. That the pressure on the ho- a horse doing competition, not only in the World Cup but also really vying for such a top position, is so much for a horse to handle. So I, I can completely see why he's made this decision. And also the traveling, of course, he's based in San Diego, California, and even just to travel to Florida, the transcontinental is one thing, but uh, transatlantic to go all the way to Hertogenbosch in in uh, the Netherlands, where the finals will take place next spring, would be you know just extra mileage on the horse. Um, and we'll talk about that actually when we when when we hear from you about your about shipping horses, Heather, because you know these kind of things we do take into account, don't we? Absolutely, yeah, have to. Um, and then some news from uh, from the FEI on the rider rankings, Heather, that Ed Gall has, uh, for the first time, he's actually taken up the top position there on the rider rankings ahead of Adeline Cornelison. And uh, Isabel, despite being sidelined having a baby, she's still in third place with Satchmo. We expect her to be coming back on the scene in the spring. And in fourth place, um, Anki with uh, Salonero and Stefan, we, we just mentioned with Ravel, is still in fifth place. So um, a lot happening. Even as we get to a relatively quiet time of the year, there's a, a lot, you know, eyes are on the top rankings right now because uh, everybody's positioning themselves, obviously, with the World Cup qualifiers and their preparation for the World Equestrian Games. I'm pleased to hear that Courtney King Dye um, has another ride. She's just been given the ride on S Infinity, an eight-year-old Sandro hit gelding that was shown successfully in the small tour. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Courtney, of course, had such bad luck when she lost two horses in the last few weeks. So uh, we're delighted that she's got another ride to add to her string. Um, and and I think there's a there's a lot of riders that are vying for the attention from the selectors, Heather. And, I mean, I know you watch this being on the Active Athletes uh, Committee and a lot of pressure on Stefan to do well next year, um, but it will be even more pressure on him if we don't have the, the you know, the the best calibre of uh, of the rest of the team members, the best possible team that we can put forward for the World Equestrian Games. It'll be interesting to see who fills those other slots, won't it? Well, absolutely. It's really exciting to, um, you know, see that Courtney has another horse. We need as much depth on the bench as we can, you know, even at last minute, you know, horses that um, have to be sidelined for various reasons or, you know, who knows what. But depth on the bench is always a valuable thing. And it's um, it's just super to see that we're gaining that with this combination here with Courtney and S Infinity. So congratulations to her. Yeah, good good for her after her uh, bad luck um back back as you say back in uh, on the radar screen for the for the selectors too and uh, we'll be watching the rest of those team members as they vie or potential team members members as they vie for a position 
uh, for selection next year. And uh, as we heard, those selection trials will take place in, in Gladstone in early July. So uh, a lot to watch out for as we get into the winter season here. Well, we're going to take a short break here, Heather, for our sponsors. And uh, we'll be right back to talk about our topic of the week, all about shipping horses long distance. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Well, thank you, Chris and Heather. It's good, Heather, to hear you back on the show again. And congratulations on your move back to Florida. Nice, warm, sunny Florida, it sounds like. Well, you know, it's that time of year when we make New Year's resolutions in a few weeks, and we should think about that also for our horses. We should take a look at what we're feeding our horses and what supplements they're getting and see if there's something we can do better. And that place that you want to take a look is Kentucky Performance Products. Kentucky Performance Products offers all kinds of supplements to help your horse through this next year. And one of those supplements is... And one of those risks for your horse is from ulcers. Uh, From mares in the pasture to equine athletes, ulcers develop quickly in stressed horses, causing sour attitude, decreased appetite, and poor performance. Protect your horse from ulcers by adding Nalox to his daily regimen. Nalox's unique formula buffers excess acid and coats the stomach for dual protection. Nalox is research proven, veterinarian recommended, and safe for horses of all ages. Brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, keeping you, helping you keep your horses healthy, sound, and competitive. So make your resolution to check out Kentucky Performance Products at kppusa.com. Well, thanks again to our sponsors and Heather. Uh, as you said earlier, you've you've been you've travelled a lot with horses long distance, but shipping five horses. Did you actually uh, did you actually hire your own plane, lease your own plane to bring those back? <laughs> I mean, five uh, five of your own horses on one plane. It pretty much needs a plane to itself, doesn't it? <laughs> well, actually, you know, those planes are just so huge. I don't know how many horses you can put on, but um, my horse boxes only took. Yeah, maybe a twentieth of that of the belly of that plane. They're they're huge. It was a this time it was an MD11. It's a cargo plane, um, no passengers, other than me and my partner and the pilot and the co-pilot. So it was just four of us on the plane, and the rest was cargo. And um, you know, along with the horses was a bunch of other stuff, including there were a couple of jet engines back there, and um, you know, various stuff. Uh, going all over the country so it's really interesting to kind of wander around and just look at the labels on some of the boxes where everything's going <laughs> <laughs> we had, well, uh, yeah five horses that were with me and and then one more so we had two pallets each pallet has um, three horses on it and um they look just a bit like a um, a horse trailer actually it's just a box with them um, three horses side by side and uh, they just load into the box, and then the box gets loaded into the plane. Well, we're just going to back step a little bit, uh, Heather, yeah. to, to help people through the process here. Because, as you say, the pallet, loading those pallets on, and they lift them up into the plane, they slide them along into the plane, and it's just so streamlined. They're so organized when you actually get to the aircraft. But when you get to that point in traveling horses or flying horses, a lot of the hard work is done. So let's let's backtrack a little bit, Heather, as to where it all begins when you want to ship a horse long distance. Where do you start? Well, you start with finding a good agent, <laughs> <laughs> um, an agent who can, you know, really help you out with all the details and um, lining everything up, the things that you have to do. Um, as far as getting your health certificates and it's it's important especially coming from Europe coming into the United States to find out what the United States needs on uh, equine importation um, as far as disease control and um, blood test to arrange that you it's a good idea to have your horses tested before you leave so you don't get any surprises when you land and then they're tested here just to know what you're going to find um, so getting blood tests arranged before travel um, is one thing that's smart to do and then of course you have to have um, international health certificates 
made by the, the government veterinarian who has to come out and in Denmark uh, in particular, they have to have a four or five day advance notice before they can come out and it has to be faxed and official and three copies of this and four copies of that. And there, there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of sort of red tape. But um, it, it, regardless, it, it all gets done and agents can really be uh, be there to help you. Um, and once all that's done, um, then what's also really valuable is if you have, let's say you just have one horse or even two, um, if you don't ship three, which three fill a container that goes onto the plane, then if you just have two, then you might end up having to pay for that um, that third slot. So uh, the agents are also pretty useful in being able to find other horses that might need to make the same trip, which really helps because then you only had, uh, end up paying for the the, however many horses you've got. Um, so let's see, where does that leave us then? Once the horses get on the plane, um, yeah, like you said, the, the hard part is more or less over for the people anyway. Um, you would end up vanning your horses from their location, their barn, probably to an, an airport like Amsterdam or Frankfurt, our typical airports that um, ship horses out. Probably not the only ones, but they're the ones I know about. And you might arrive with your horses in the in the ground transportation um, about four hours before the flight is scheduled to leave. And then um, the horses are loaded onto their into their containers, their boxes. Um, usually isn't too much more traumatic to do that than it is to put your horse in a horse trailer. Actually, I feel like the ground transport is almost more, you know, more stressful and tough on the horses than actually the flight is because there's road noise and they're starting and stopping and um, it, they can't uh, relax as well as they can actually when, they, when they're flying in the plane. So, um, they get to the airport, they get loaded on their crates, they stand to make sure everyone is comfortable and quiet, and then they take the box out to the airplane, and they, and they have a one of those, I don't know what they call them, it's like an elevator kind of thing, and the box gets pushed over onto that elevator, and the elevator lifts the box up to the cargo door, and they get pushed into the plane. Now, the floor has a bunch of little rollers on it, so... They just get pushed over on the little rollers um, into the into the cargo area of the plane, and then they just get secured down, and, and that's it. So um, I think there are probably some um, airplanes or you know where you can fly horses where they actually have to walk onto the plane. Um, I've never done that. It's always been a matter of putting them onto the into the container, and then the container just gets handled. So. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me about um, the trip and what it's like and a lot of details. And most people think that it's, you know, it seems like a really big deal. But I, I think it comes down to um, I would almost rather have my horses go in an airplane than in a truck on the road. Um, unless you get turbulence, the airplane gets pretty still and quiet. And I think that they can they can actually sleep. Um, and I don't I haven't experienced a whole a whole lot of anybody getting nervous or you know a lot of people say well do you have to drug them to go on the airplane and that's not a very normal thing i think um it's as much as it would be that they get stressed on a on a truck they could um, also get stressed in an airplane but i mean normally i think the horses handle it pretty well so um especially you know once take off and cruising altitude then it's um it's really that's the very easy part and everyone can just take a deep breath and relax and now as far as takeoff and landings go the, the pilots are trained to obviously fly live cargo and their and their ascent and descent is very gradual isn't it um, you know, they do what they can i mean of course the the airport uh, restrictions on um climb rates and things like that have to take precedence over the horses. And, um, yes, the pilots definitely know what cargo they have. Um, every time I've been on a, on a freighter or a cargo flight, you get to, of course, talk. You are part of the crew, and you get to um, talk with them quite a bit and ask lots of questions. And most of them fly horses on a fairly regular basis, and they do what they can. They're very concerned about keeping the climate 
just as you know c- controlled as you want it and um they can you know make whatever temperature you want and a cooler temperature is better than a warm one back there um so they have a lot of experience with that but um you know they have to fly the plane first and they do what they can about the you know keeping the horses of course very comfortable now do you give them water and hay or a feed during that during a flight how how long was your flight from amsterdam to miami heather uh, from, from takeoff to landing was about, uh, I think it was nine hours and 45 minutes this time. We had quite a, I think a headwind. So it took a, about half an hour longer than usual. And it was straight from this time. It was straight from Amsterdam to Miami, which was, um, um, nice that it was direct. Of course, living in West Palm beach, then there's very little amount of ground transportation after quarantine in Miami. That's nice. So um, it's uh, they have a hay bag hanging, and most of the horses were munching the whole time on their hay bags, and a few of them have water, but like we all know, some horses drink and transport, and some don't. It's nice if they do at such a long time um, that you have your water jugs and water buckets, and um, I don't normally feed any concentrate. Um, really, I try to to um, lower the amount of concentrate that they eat for a few days before they even leave the home stable, um, you know, just to kind of bring them down a little bit and they don't have a whole lot of, uh, they're not used to a large amount of that because they're so state, you know, sedentary or not moving around for quite a few hours from when it comes to from door to door. So I don't usually feed concentrate. You can, um, or you can give treats, carrots, you know, whatever keeps a horse happy. But um, normally hay and water is um, pretty much going to keep them uh, what they need. Well, give us an idea what, what, what the horses were wearing. Presumably they wear wraps. What else do you put? Do you put a pole guard and a tail guard and a roller? Do you have any a cooler or anything on them, or does that depend on the weather? Heather, what did, what did you have with your horses coming over? Well, that's a really good question. Um, You have to just take a deep breath and give up a little bit of um, what we would normally want to protect our horses and wrap them up with. Because on the plane, the only thing basically that you're allowed to have on your horse is bell boots. Um, If you you want that, that's allowed. They won't allow you to have anything on their legs at all uh, and no blankets. So, but, you know, the only time if it's really cold and your horse, like, is clipped um, or, you know, just a short hair or whatever, and you think that they're they're going to have a hard time with that, the the only time the climate really isn't going to be controlled is when the, from the time when they leave the, the area where they're loaded, and that's all climate controlled. Um, when they're um, taken out on the tarmac, um, until the time they get in the plane. And the box can be completely enclosed with a tarp that goes down in front of them and a tarp that goes down behind. So they're not going to be out in the cold wind. But when they come off the truck and before they get on the box, you have to take all their blankets off. And that's just because if there becomes a problem with a blanket or the shipping wrap falls down, the horse is kicking and can't get rid of it, um, you know, things fail. Velcro comes off, um, you know, wraps move around. You really can't fit in that container with your horse to fix it. And so that's the reason behind their restrictions on no blankets, no wraps. So you just have to cross your fingers and say, all right, well, this is the way it is. You can't change it. So um, you can't you can't dress them with anything. I mean, I put some fleeces on their halter, but they don't want any other equipment on them. And how about their tail? Yeah, nothing on that either. Right, right. Not not even a tail guard, if not a bandage, a tail guard. So can they sit on their tail? Does, I mean, is that a, a worry that some horses sit back when they're taking off? Um, yes, they could. I mean, if your horse has, say, a long tail, they could actually step on it. Of course, you can braid it and you can tie it up so that they don't step on it if it's a long tail. Um, you know, I don't have that concern with mine. They're, they're banged at the uh, ankle. But they could sit back... Um, that could be a concern. They could rub, um, and that's just something that you, like I said, you just have to say, well, this is the way it is, and you'd love to be more protective, but it's um, it's some of the, the restrictions on, on flying the horses. And do you ever, have you ever experienced a horse that, 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 that gets distressed in, in flight or at takeoff? Uh, have you ever been that? I know there have been, there have been situations um, in, in, in my experience when I was grooming. Have you come across any of that, Heather? 
I have, you know, not at a level where I have felt that the horse is in danger or that it would endanger the plane or other horses. Um, but I have um, actually administered some sedative to horses a few times just because I don't want them to, um, you know, exist in a stress level that I think would, you know, after landing or a few days later, whatever, affect them in a negative way. So I have and horses that either just get tired of standing still and they kick a lot. Um, you know, maybe you have two next to each other that are just really not uh, fond of each other and they just start this back and forth kind of um, communication with each other that just makes them stressed or something that, um, you know, where they're just uneasy and, and I would just rather have them relax for uh, for health reasons, just an overall health reason. I have given sedatives for that, but I, I fortunately have never seen anybody have any real emergencies or, um, you know, reasons where if you didn't sedate them that you would have some serious consequences. So uh, I'm sure it happens, you know, and it also probably happens in trailering horses on the road. And um, uh, there may be the consequences are a little more serious if a horse goes crazy 30,000 feet up in the air. You certainly don't want to... Um, affect the airplane's ability to fly but I, I you know I really wonder how common that is or if you know how many times it happens I, I don't know anybody personally that's had you know really dire situation up there in the air so you know when I load with horses and I plan a trip I don't I don't have a whole lot of stress and worry thinking oh my gosh I really hope this you know doesn't end in disaster I, I, I don't think it's all that common really okay well, just backing off to before you actually leave the home stable, Heather, you said you you toned down their feed a little bit just to, you know, prepare them for that period of inactivity. Does that mean you back off with their work and their training routine as well? Yeah, that's a good question. I do. I just don't like them to work, you know, at full steam and then all of a sudden that's cut off. Um, these horses that I just flew over with, uh, ended up missing out on a total of uh, seven or eight days of training. And those days of not being trained is also either um, standing in a, a stall, a traveling stall, or in a, a stable, a box, and quarantine. And so that's not even hand walking. That's not um, any really form of exercise at all. So... I like to just, you know, lower the workload, um, lower the calorie intake. Uh, I mean, a lot of horses lose weight on the trip just from the stress and the nature of it. So, you know, I don't want them to lose weight when I decrease the food, but lower the workload and the food concentrate level just so that then all of a sudden there isn't a big difference between what they were doing and then the, the seven or eight days of so much inactivity and stress and, you know, these were all geldings. And, you know, if you have a stallion or a mare, then the quarantine times are way longer. And, you know, the time out of work is way longer than what you have to um, handle with a gelding. So I, I just think it's a good idea to, to gradually bring them down and gradually bring them back up when uh, when you get them back. All right. Consider it a period of inactivity and, and prepare accordingly, I think is the message there. But when you when you arrive, Heather, um, you, as you mentioned, they have to go into quarantine. If they're geldings, it's not so long as mares and, and, and stallions. So talk us through that when the plane lands. And uh, I'm sure you breathe a huge sigh of relief that you're not only on terra firma, but you're back on your homeland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was a good feeling. Um, we flew into Miami and, you know, just looking out the window and seeing the coast of Florida arriving was very exciting. So um, and we had a beautiful sunset to fly into, too. That that was just picture perfect. Um, so uh, your question was when they when they get here, um, when you when you land, what, what happens? Yeah. Um, well, we land, and of course, you can tend to the horses as as you're landing on some flights. If you're in a combination flight where there's freight and passengers, you're required to have a seat belt on and to sit down. Um, in particular, freight liners, you can um, tend to the horses. So you are in contact with them then. But as soon as you come up to your uh, to the gate, then you have to um, unload and that's the last time you're allowed to touch the horses or um, care for them at all. So they're taken off to the place where they go into quarantine and 
you know, all the passengers and the pilots and everybody on the plane has to go through customs because we're coming from international destinations. So we all have to go through customs, get our bags checked, all that like you would normally do on any flight at all. And then after we clear customs ourselves, then we can go around and watch the horses get offloaded from their boxes and walk down the little hallway that goes into a very nice quarantine facility in Miami. It's air conditioned and quite modern and nice and beautiful. Um, you watch them offload and go down the little hallway and that's the last you get to see of them. So you're not allowed into quarantine itself because of obvious reasons. And um, then you can uh, pretty much go do what you have to do until you get your horses released from quarantine, which is with geldings around usually around 48 hours. Um, they're tested for a few things um, for diseases that i um, concerned about and, then once that lab work comes back, then you can come pick your horse up from quarantine and um, off you're off and running. And you mentioned for, for obviously geldings is one thing that's pretty short, but for, for stallions coming into the U.S. and for mares, it's a, a good bit longer. Do you know what those uh, requirements are just now, Heather? Um, you know, I hear different things. I haven't done a stallion or a mare importation for quite a while, and I think mares can be anywhere between two to four weeks. And I think that has to do with how quickly the lab gets the, the blood work. And, you know, of course, those are sensitive tests. And if they all come out right, then it, it can be as quickly as uh, two weeks. And I think I've heard of some being in longer for various reasons. And I think uh, stallions might be the same. Stallions actually have to live cover um, mare. And then the mare has to get tested to see if he's carrying any sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, and the mares are tested also for... Um, uh, contagious equine metritis, CEM, um, stallions and mares are both tested for that. So that's why their quarantine is longer. And, of course, geldings don't have that concern since they're not breeding animals. Um, and they get uh, tested for things that can be drawn from a blood test, which goes to the lab, you know, within 24 hours you have the result back. So that's why there's a difference in uh, time length between mares, geldings, and stallions. Um, of course, then the expense is also higher on a gelding, uh, on a stallion and, and a mare, also because of the length and the extensive testing that they do on those. The geldings are also um, more inexpensive to import, and that's um, that's a concern, of course, for horse buyers. And, um, and the time element is a concern for competitive horses. You don't want to have to be off of them for so long. Um, so there's a big difference. So w- with flying horses, do you? Uh, do you uh, get air miles for flying horses? Does it depend, depend on the airline? Which airline were you with? <laughs> uh, we were with a cargo line called Martin Air. They're, oh, yes. Uh, uh-huh. KLM. Yeah. Yes. And, I, don't, and, I, don't, I don't know if, it, if you get KLM air miles then, would you? Well, I don't know about the horses, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do, do you? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Now, you have to mention that you also brought some other four-legged friends over too on that flight. So it was a bit like Noah's Ark, wasn't it? Well, a little bit. <laughs> we, uh, I have my two whippets that made the trip also, and then we had a cat come with us. So we had to bring the whole family. I refuse to leave my pets anywhere. If they can't come with me, I won't move. So, um, they were also on the plane and they, they enjoyed the fact that we were on a cargo plane, which means they could come out of their kennels and have the run of the airplane, which was quite a luxury for them. I think Flex was even playing with his ball, a little bit of retrieving his ball back and forth in the airplane. So, lucky dog. <laughs> yeah, that's got to be an ideal situation. And I'm sure the, the horses know the dogs too, so everybody feels feels at home. Um, and there, there must be some covenant level of that, you know, of the dogs, you know, being, but certain, certainly being loose on the aircraft. I think that's really cool that you could... Uh, you know, have such a comfortable flight with the dogs getting out of their crate. I flew a dog, you know, Kerry, my little Irish black and tan terrier. I flew her from Dublin to BWI, um, what's going to be nine years ago now. And she was in a tiny little crate all on her own. And she'd been quite cold down there in the hold. So I don't think it was climate control just to the standard of luxury that you had for the horses. Uh, but it's a, it's an interesting experience, isn't it, flying animals around the world? Well, it really is, um, especially when you get lucky enough to go on a cargo plane rather than a combi where they've got passengers and just cargo in the back. The yeah. cargo planes are really quite a nice experience, yeah, really luxurious. 
Well, great. Well, we're glad you all got here safe and sound, and uh, you've got some nice dressage horses that you're going to be uh, bringing out in in the next few months down there in Wellington. And we look forward to to uh, watching those come out on the scene. Um, are you going to give away any any secrets of what what you've got in your arsenal this this time, Heather? For my training tip. No, well, no, for the horses that you have. We're coming to your training tick in a, in a second. I was wondering if you are going to give anything away oh, about the horses. horses. Yes. Well, I have um, I have some interesting ones. I won't give away too much. <laughs> I have one that I hope to bring out in maybe fourth, uh, third or fourth level um, sometime in mid-season. And I have two uh, horses that have come for a couple of clients of mine that will be showing and um, – a six-year-old and an 11-year-old, very nice horses, very special. I'm very happy to have them in my barn for sure. Oh, good. Well, we will look forward to, to seeing what you unveil as the season uh, unfolds. Well, Heather, um, as, as you know, when you were part of the show um, way back, well, it was quite a few months ago, wasn't it? You were a regular co-host with me, and uh, you provided these training tips. In fact, you started off the training tip of the week, and it became very popular now. So we, we actually can't have a show without a training tip of the week. So tell us what you've got in store for us this time. Well, I'm just going to talk a little bit about rain back, um, because I, I use it as a um, pretty big element in my training program and I also find that when I meet new riders and new students, um, that uh, I think there's a lot of misconception about it and maybe some um, kind of fear of letting horses do it uh, to a level where I think that they they can benefit from it. Um, there's a number of things about reinback that I think are important. Number one, when the horse is learning how to move their center of gravity further back from the front of their forehand, further back into the body. Um, I think a really good way to illustrate that to the horse is by having him take a step back. Um, it's, a, it's really the same kind of muscles that um, the horse has connecting its rib cage to its shoulder blades that um, they have to use when they take a step back that lifts the whole rib cage up in between the shoulder blades and that adds to the horse's balance moving backwards. It's not very... Um, um, normal to to say much about dressage that is from front to back but i think the balance has to come of course from the front of the horse to the back um so when they take a step backwards that's the first part first kind of moment you can illustrate to the horse that this is a good thing um i think the one of the things that happens pretty commonly next is that the horse might get anticipating it um and take a step back sometimes when it's their own idea or they think, okay, I've got this, now I'm going to do it for you, um, that a lot of riders will then say, "Uh uh-oh, don't go backwards, you must go forward. And then the horse tries to go back, which, again, is the same moment as him moving his center of gravity back. And then the rider kind of tells him, no, 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 don't do that. I think it's pretty common. And then I think the horse thinks, okay, I won't go back. And then when the rider comes to the point of saying, well, but bring your center of gravity back or collect – the horse is thinking, but you don't let me. Um, so I think there gets to be some um, confusion between the horse and rider about what's allowed and what's not in that case. So um, normally when, when the horse comes to that point where they start anticipating going back, um, I let them, even if they do it too too much, to the point where I might ask for two steps, even if they do 20, um, I'll just let them and just keep staying just plugged in in the saddle and not thinking, oh, this can't be, or punishing them for going backwards, just being there, kind of passively persistent. And the same moment I was in before, and, and almost every horse stops going backwards when they realize it doesn't make a rise out of the rider. It doesn't change anything. They just realize, well, I guess there's no reason to keep going back. Um, a lot of riders, if the horse goes back, they'll let go of the rein. They will kick the horse as if it's a punishment. Um, something will change and the horse thinks, okay, I got the rider. So, you know, then maybe they keep going back. But if the rider can just sit sort of passive persistent and say, well, you know, you'll figure out eventually that you don't have to go back anymore. The horse has almost always stopped doing it. And then the rider can say, good, now we can go forward again. But in the meantime, the horse doesn't get afraid of going back, which is such a, an essential element in collection that the horse realizes that they can be confident when they move the center of gravity back. 
So um, um, just and then that kind of wraps up what I want to talk about with the rain back. But there's just a, one more piece about it that has to be understood, too, and that you can use rain back a lot, but it must never be used as a punishment. Um, you know, if the horse goes back anticipating it on their own, they shouldn't be punished for doing it. But they also should not be made to go backwards as a punishment for something. Um, so it's a it's a really super tool to use. It has to be used like anything, just right. Um, but I do find that in general, throughout the places that I go teach, and it's in Europe and in the states throughout, that in general it is misunderstood and it is um, lacking. I think in a in a complete training program, and I use it quite often, and really find the horses benefit from it. So I hope that's helpful for our listeners. Well, I have a question, Heather, about the training, the very first steps of training the rein back, because you see, even in the old Spanish riding schools in Jerez, and the the old classical dressage trainers would often teach the rein back from the ground using a long whip, um, sometimes with the rider in the saddle, but often as not without. What's your feelings about training the rein back from the ground? Um, I definitely do that first, and I'll do it with a halter, a lead rope, and using um, a whip. So, of course, not strong with a whip, but if you put halter pressure backwards on the horse and you can tap lightly on the chest until the horse even just barely even takes a step back, then you can stop you tapping with a whip and you can stop the halter pressure. And then you can try another step or another one or another one. Um, but I think it's a great idea to start it on the ground first. First with halter pressure, when you add pressure, the horse steps back. And when the horse steps back, you can lighten the pressure and they get the reward for having done it with the lack of pressure. And then you can move on from that to doing it with a bridle. So when there's bridle pressure, the horse knows how to step back. And then when they do step back, there can be a less pressure. It would be a, a kind of a normal progression so how do you define between a horse reining back because he's getting the hang of reining back on his own, as you just mentioned, and allowing that, to a young horse that starts to back up, um, which is part of a napping and shying away, um, and it can eventually uh, end up with him spinning around to, to avoid something. But it begins with them reining back. Now, if you're not experienced and you don't anticipate that that actually is, you know, it's a misdemeanor, if you like. It's not It's not a schooling aid and it's mm-hmm. not, rain back is not, is, in, in, in the sense that you want to educate them, is, 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 is not what they're about. How do you address that if it's part of, part of them misbehaving? Well, that is a, it's a tricky thing. Um, if they do it because they've kind of cottoned on to, oh, this can get the rider upset or something like that. I mean, the way I do it, um, what I would do in that situation is ride, just go with the horse back. Just just as a, it, it, the psychology behind it is so that the horse doesn't think that it's a forbidden thing. And, you know, like raising a child or, I mean, I have a dog that knows that if I have something he, that I don't want him to have, he takes it. So, you know, he, he knows what's forbidden. Um, I think a horse can be the same if they if they know it's forbidden territory, they can slip into it and really think, oh, I've gotten away from you. So so if the horse starts going back, he's realized this might be a way to get away from the situation or, you know, a scary thing or a training moment that's challenging, whatever he's doing it for. I think if you just go with it. And and realize that you have forward, backward, left, and right as as four possible directions that are that you can do. That the backwards one isn't as wrong as what's most often believed. And if as long as the horse is thinking, "I'll get away from you by going back," then you should just be going back with them until they realize that it's not forbidden. And I, just in my experience. I have one yet to prove to me um, that they that they won't eventually say, okay, well, if this isn't forbidden, then I'll just quit doing it as an evasion. Um, but but so easily we think the horse must go forward, and they must. But you you always have the four directions possible, and backwards just can't be forbidden. 
the the only tricky ones are the horses that have a tendency to rear and you know that i have to say is a is the trickiest kind not all horses have that tendency at all but there are some out there that do and and then this is a it's just a little bit more fuzzy what you do with it but but in general that just think the psychology is don't let them think that it's forbidden and it may take a month it may take a week it may take a day it may take five minutes um how quickly they come to that point where they realize and and they go past that point where they take a step back and then they start taking advantage um each horse is a little different on how quickly but but even if it takes a month i, I know that still at the end of that um set will be a horse that realizes that backwards is not frightening it's not to be punished and it's not forbidden and then it just be, it becomes a non-issue the the problem about going back goes away well, good advice, and I think, as, as you say, just to be real clear that there are horses that will use the rein back as a precursor to, to rearing or spinning round and sometimes bolting. Um, that's happened to me, I'm afraid, um, But and it can begin with the rein back. So you have to be very clear in understanding your horse yes. and understanding his temperament and why he's doing it and that it's in a relaxed state of mind. It's not in a... And an evasive or a stressed situation where no. uh, that they could be fleeing, which is part of their obviously instinct to flee from something. Yeah, you you know I could I could um, definitely advise that you shouldn't be working on rainback when you feel that your horse is in a highly stressed state of mind. You know, for that moment, Quite. The horse first come from a neutral state of mind. Quite. And if he's already stressed and chomping and sweating and nervous, then that probably isn't the right time to say, well, let's work on this. Um, it has to be when the horse is settled, neutral, and you can try from, from a neutral moment, then try a step. Um, much more likely that it'll be successful in that, in that case. Absolutely. Well, good advice. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Well, we are just about clear running out of time this week, Heather. We just want to mention to everybody that uh, if you don't follow the show, you'll... Uh, uh, you can uh, always check us out. The show notes are on the dressageradio dot com. If you're new, to, if you're a new listener, uh, but you'll know if you follow us regularly that you can contact us by leaving a voicemail, and that number is also on our website. That is two seven zero eight zero three zero zero two five. You can contact me, at Chris, at horseradionetwork dot com. Don't forget we have a fan page on Facebook for the Dressage Radio Show, and we love to get your comments there. Don't forget to visit us there on Facebook. It's just called the Dressage Radio Show, if you put in that search at the top of the Facebook page. And there's a link to that page also on our website. And as always, you can follow us on Twitter. We post all the show updates every month, every week, rather all the shows on the Horse Radio Network. They, they're on um, by following us on Twitter, you can know, you'll know exactly when they're being posted. And our Twitter name is Horse Radio, or you can follow me at Chris E. Stafford. We'd like to thank our sponsors again, Kentucky Performance Products. They can be found at kppusa.com. Well, Heather, it's been great fun having you back on the show. Um, I know you, you had to leave us earlier in the year because of your preparations for getting back to the state. So now that you're here, hopefully you'll be a, a regular visitor back to the show. Well, I'd like to join back in. It's been great fun. Well, thank you ever so much, and uh, good luck with all your preparations for the upcoming season. And I uh, want to remind everybody that uh, you, can, you can find out what Heather's up to by going to heatherblitz.info. That's her website. And uh, following the Mind Your Riding tour that uh, Heather has all around the country, and also what she'll be doing down in Warrington, Florida, as the season unfolds. Well, good luck with that, Heather. Come back and visit us often. And uh, for now, though, that's about it for this week. So, Heather. Good luck, everybody, and mind your riding.